In this example, we've got an object, in this case, just this disc or this circle. And we're assuming it's got a, uh, it's rooted in place at this pivot point. So it's able to swivel around that pivot point, but this point is fixed in place. And we're assuming that there's several forces acting on it. And if we want to figure out the torques involved, or at least uh, to start with, figure out if there is any torque and then maybe relatively how big the torques are, uh, even if we don't have exact numbers. Uh, what we want to do is draw in the radius vectors because how do we define torque in the first place, at least magnitude of torque? How do we find how strong the torque is? Yeah, R, R times F. So R, just the radial distance times the force, but also times what else? What else matters there other than just distance and force? Sine theta. Yeah, the direction matters. So we have a times sine theta representing the angle between the radius and the force. Or alternatively, a couple other uh, geometric substitutions you can make. F times sine theta, due to the right triangle trigonometry, F times sine theta just becomes the perpendicular component of force. So you could write this as the radius times just the perpendicular component of the force. That is how much of the force is perpendicular to the radius vector. Or alternatively, you could keep force as it is, but combine R times sine theta to get just the perpendicular component of R. So you could think of it as the total, the actual radius times the actual force times the sine of the angle between those vectors, or the actual radius times just the amount of force that's perpendicular to the radius, or the actual force times just the amount of distance that's perpendicular to the force. These all give you the same result. They're just different ways of writing the same thing. And to see that visually, let's try actually drawing in the radius vectors. Uh, starting with, let's start with F1 for or F2 actually. We'll probably draw these in the wrong order. But F2, we draw in a radius vector just from the pivot point to the location the force is located, where the force is being applied. So this would be the radius vector here. This would be radius vector, let's call this R2. And as we draw in that radius vector, what do you notice right away about radius vector R2 and force vector F2? Um, you can't make a perpendicular line. Yeah, there is no way to make a perpendicular component here because radius, the radius vector and the force vector are parallel to each other. So uh, one way to look at this is in terms of the angle. What's the angle between the radius vector and the force vector? How do their directions compare? Uh, you might call it 180, although I'd be more inclined to say, yeah, I'd be more inclined to say zero here. They end up being the same thing. Sine of zero is zero, sine of 180 is also zero. So in terms of the actual result, it doesn't make a difference. But in cases where it, it does matter, I would say that this angle would be zero degrees because the vectors are pointing in the same direction. There's no offset in how they're pointing, in the direction they're pointing. Whereas 180 degrees, I would think would be something more like if you got this vector and this vector. If they're pointing in exact opposite degrees, I'd call that angle 180 degrees. Whereas if they're pointing in the same direction, there's no difference between the direction. So in that case, theta would be zero. Degrees. Because theta is about the difference between which directions they're pointing. Either way, though, sine of zero or sine of 180 are both zero. So that means you get no torque at all. And conceptually, that's like if you've got this object and you just grab it and pull directly away from the pivot point, or if you push directly towards the pivot point, nothing happens. You get no rotational change. So this force pulling directly away from the pivot point, directly along the radial direction, causes no rotational change. It exerts no torque. You could also think of that as splitting it into components. If we keep the radius, let's split up the force. We'd be splitting the force into 
a parallel component, which is the whole thing, and a perpendicular component, which is zero, using the idea of an axis in the radial direction and an axis perpendicular to the radial direction. The force F2 is entirely in the parallel direction, so there is no perpendicular component. Or the other way around, if you split up the radius based on the force vector, we create an axis parallel to the force vector, which is the entire radius vector, and an axis perpendicular to the radius to the force vector, and the radius has no perpendicular component. So in this case, R perpendicular would be zero. Or alternatively, you split up the force, you get F perpendicular equals zero. In fact, we can say F parallel here is the entire magnitude of F2. And F perpendicular here is zero. It has no perpendicular component. Any questions on that case so far? And then if we take a look at F3, let me blur this out a little bit. If we now take a look at F3, we draw in a radius vector, once again, from the pivot point to the location where the force is being applied. So we call this, let's say, R3. And what do you notice right away about radius vector R3 and force vector F3? They're perpendicular. The angle between them is a right angle or in degree measured 90 degrees. So what does that suggest about the torque? Do we have no torque or a little bit of torque or a medium amount of torque or a lot of torque? Yeah, the, sign, the, the angle being, being perpendicular means you're gonna get a lot of torque, the most torque possible for that force at that location. If you had had that same force in any other direction, it's gonna be a weaker torque. 90 degrees gets you the most torque possible for that force at that location. <clears throat> and that's because sine of 90 degrees is one. So you get R times F times one. That's the biggest it can possibly be. Or if we look at it in terms of splitting it up into components, let's say we're looking at the, the radial direction. We use the radius vector to define a new set of axes, new component system, and then split up F3 based on those axes. So we create a parallel axis, that is an axis parallel to the radius, and a perpendicular axis based on the radius. And what would you say about F3 in terms of parallel versus perpendicular components? How much of F3 is perpendicular? If we were doing this just as a regular x, y axis, let's say we have an x axis and a y axis, and we have a vector that looks like this. How much of that vector is in the x direction versus how much is in the y direction? Yeah, this is all in the x direction. So its x component would be its entire magnitude. Let's say we call this vector u. We can say the x component is the entire magnitude, and it has no y component at all, so its y component would be zero. So we can say vector u is magnitude comma zero. Same thing here. We're not really calling these the usual x and y axes. We're calling them the perpendicular axis and the parallel axis. But the name of the axes doesn't really matter. This force vector is entirely along the perpendicular axis. So the perpendicular component is the entire vector, the, the entire magnitude, I should say. The, per, the parallel component is zero. There is no force in the parallel direction, all the forces in the perpendicular direction. So in this case, we would say the perpendicular component is the entire magnitude, and the parallel component is zero. And this also ties into why we get lots of torque here. The perpendicular component is the entire magnitude. 
So when we multiply r times f perpendicular, we're multiplying the radius times the entire magnitude, not just some percentage of the magnitude. So that gives us the largest possible torque. Or alternatively, if we split this up into axes based on the force. If we write axes based on the force, we draw in an axis parallel to the force. So we call this the parallel axis and an axis perpendicular to the force. So we call this vertical the perpendicular yeah. axis. So in this case, we'd say the radius is entirely in the perpendicular direction and has no parallel component. So if we were splitting up the radius into components, we would say R3, the magnitude is the perpendicular component and the parallel component would be zero. So once again, we've got a large perpendicular component leading to a large amount of torque. We'd have the force, F3 as it is, times the perpendicular component of the radius. But in this case, because they're perpendicular already, the perpendicular component of R3 is all of R3. Any questions on that example so far? Then let's take a look at F1. We'll draw in our radius vector. I'm going to need to put some more space up here as well. So we draw our radius vector. And in this case, the angle is not zero degrees and the angle is not uh, 90 degrees. So it gets a little more complicated. And there's a couple of different ways you could measure the angle. You could say that the angle is this angle here. Or alternatively, you could extend the direction of the radius vector and say we're talking about this angle here. So there's two different places, two different ways you can measure theta. These do lead to different angles, but what do those angles add up to? Right, these two possible ways of measuring theta add up to 180. They are supplementary angles. And one of the properties of the sine function is that supplementary angles have the same sine value. So it ultimately doesn't matter if you're using this angle or this angle. If you take sine of this acute angle versus sine of this obtuse angle, you'll get the same result anyway. So you could use either one. I usually just by, by, by custom use the smaller angle, the acute angle, because it's usually easier to work with an acute angle than an obtuse angle. So let's say theta is the acute angle made between the extended radius vector and the force vector because direction is really all that matters anyway. So we've got that angle. It is more than zero, so we do get some torque. It's also less than 90, so we don't get the maximum amount of torque. We just get some torque. Uh, to split it into components though, let's say we keep the radius vector and we wanna split the force vector into components. Let me clear up some more space here as well. The idea is we want to create a, a coordinate system based on the radius vector. So we're going to create a, a, a axis, an axis in the direction parallel to the radius. There's the parallel axis. And we're going to create an axis perpendicular to the radius. So that'll be this direction here. And note that this is not referring to the radius of the circle itself necessarily. We're talking, we're not talking about distance from the center of the circle to the point on the edge. The radial vector is always from the pivot point, wherever that happens to be, to the location where the force is being applied. So this does not mean the radius of the object itself. R means the, the displacement vector from the pivot point to the location where the force is being applied. So this is our new coordinate system. We've got an axis, we're, we're defining an axis parallel to the radius and an axis perpendicular to the radius. And then we wanna split up the force vector into components. So we're gonna create a component parallel to the radius and a component perpendicular to the radius. So one way you could do this is imagine, uh, we usually call this dropping a perpendicular or dropping an altitude to one of the axes. Let's say we just draw a dotted line from the tip of the vector to one of the axes. 
And then we can split this up into a perpendicular component and a parallel component. So the perpendicular component would be just this much. The parallel component would be just this much. We're still just splitting the vector into right angle components. It's just that instead of using the conventional x, y axis, we're using a tilted axis defined by the radial vector. And which one of those components do we actually care about for torque? F perp. Yeah, F perp is all we care about. We can ignore the parallel component because that doesn't actually directly influence torque. But the perpendicular component is what we use. So to calculate the torque, you could take the entire radius vector times the entire magnitude of the force times the angle, sine of the angle between them. Or you can multiply the entire radius vector times just the perpendicular component of the force. So if you've got numbers for those, you could just multiply those together. Radius times just the perpendicular component of the force, ignore the angle, and that tells you the torque. Any questions on that so far? Yeah, quick question. Um, I think you, you answered this, but to clarify, the fact that you chose theta to be from the, the parallel line, not perpendicular, are you saying that's because you'll get the same value if you use? Well, the theta is, in, theta is not really so much about the axes we draw in. Theta is the angle between the radius vector and the force vector. So if we were to, and it, it sometimes helps to imagine drawing those vectors from the same origin. If you take uh, this radius vector, so here's vector R1, and this force vector, I'm just going to put that over here. Because it doesn't really matter where you draw vectors. Once we've established the radius vector and the force vector, we could move those around however we want to do some arithmetic with them. So we've got our radius vector, we've got our force vector, and the angle between them would be this angle here. So that's the same as the angle I drew here by imagining extending the radius vector. Uh, the other version of the angle we could use would be this angle. And note that that's not the angle between the perpendicular axis and the force. That's the angle between the radius vector itself and the force. But again, I think the acute angle would be easier to use. And it doesn't really matter because since we're going to be taking the sine of. And sine of the acute angle or the obtuse angle will lead to the same result anyway. OK, so would you recommend in general to choose the angle that's less than 90? Yeah, uh, as long as you're talking about sine, that, and you have the option of uh, the obtuse angle or the acute angle, as long as they're they're uh, supplementary, as long as they add up to 180. Both of those angles will have the same sign anyway. Okay, thank you. Their cosines, however, would be opposite. If you were taking the cosine of these angles, you'd find that one of them is a positive value, the other one is a negative value, although they'll still have the same absolute value. Any other questions on that so far? So also from this diagram, if you, if you draw, if you redraw both vectors as having the same origin, you could also draw the components that way. You could say we're drawing a, a perpendicular component and a parallel component. And this is in 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 the study of vectors, this is usually called the projection, the idea of taking this force vector and flattening it onto R1. So the, the uh, parallel component would be called the projection of the force vector onto the radius vector. If you imagine like shining a bright light perpendicular to the radius vector, the force vector would cast a shadow on the radius vector. That shadow is the parallel component. But what we care about is the perpendicular component. Any other questions on those components so far? And the other way we could split this up into components, instead of uh, keeping the radius and splitting up the force, we could reverse that. We could keep the force vector 
and split up the radius. So let me tidy up this diagram a bit. So same force vector, same radius vector. But let's say in this case, let's say we want to keep the force vector, but split up the radius vector and components instead. What we can do is draw out a new set of axes based on the force vector. So we draw an axis parallel to the force vector and an axis perpendicular to the force vector. Parallel, perpendicular. And now we're going to want to split up the radius vector into a perpendicular component and a parallel component. So I think in this case, we can just sort of flatten the radius vector onto the perpendicular axis. So the radius vector can be split into a parallel component. This is the amount of the radius vector parallel to the force and a perpendicular component. This is how much of the radius vector is perpendicular to the force. So we'd say this is our perpendicular and this is our parallel. And again, which one of those components do we actually care about if we're looking for torque? Yeah, we care about the perpendicular component. So you could calculate the amount of torque by just multiplying the entire force vector magnitude times just the perpendicular component of the radius and ignore the parallel component because the perpendicular component is what actually matters for torque. So again, there's three ways to do this. You can multiply the entire radius vector magnitude times the entire force magnitude times the sine of the angle between them, if you know all three of those. Or you could multiply the entire radius vector by just the perpendicular component of the, radius, of the force vector. Or multiply the entire force vector times just the perpendicular component of the radius vector. All three of those give you the same result. They're ultimately doing the same thing, just different ways of writing it. Any other questions on that F1 so far? Also, while we're at it, which direction would that torque be? How would you figure out a direction to assign to the torque? Yeah, based on the right hand rule, that should be into the page. And you can narrow it down to two possible directions without even using the right hand rule. If you've got the radius vector this way and the force vector this way. So that's radius vector and force vector. The most important rule here is that the torque is perpendicular to both of those. The only possible directions perpendicular to both of these are straight out or straight in. And then the right hand rule will tell you which one it is. So with your right hand, put your hand at the pivot point, stretch out your fingers along the radius vector and curl in the direction of the force and your thumb will tell you the direction of the torque. So in this case, with this radius and this force, the torque would be inwards. Again, that doesn't mean anything's moving inwards. It just means the torque is trying to create rotation along that axis. So this axis of rotation would mean rotation in the clockwise direction. So this torque is trying to make clockwise rotation, or at least clockwise rotational acceleration. Any other questions on that torque so far? And just for a little more practice, let's try this with F4 as well. So there's F4, radius vector as usual is from the pivot point to the location of the force. Extend the radius vector. And again, we've got two options for angle. We could say the angle is this angle, or we could say the angle is this angle. 
Either one will work. They both give you the same sine theta. Uh, so I would just choose the acute angle just to make things easier to work with. But either way will work. So we could calculate torque for by taking the entire radius times the entire force times sine of the angle between them. Or we could split one vector or the other vector into components. For instance, if we want to split up the force vector, we could draw out a coordinate system based on the radius vector. So we create an axis parallel to the radius vector and an axis perpendicular to the radius vector. And we might want to extend that further because this is a large force vector. And we need to split up that force vector into a parallel component and a perpendicular component. So if you imagine just taking that vector and flattening it onto one axis or the other axis, you could flatten this straight onto the perpendicular axis. So just draw in a, what we call an altitude, a line from the tip of the vector perpendicular to one of the axes. Something like this. And then fill in the other side of that right triangle. Because ultimately, you're just trying to make a right triangle where the uh, vector itself is the, the hypotenuse. And the two sides are one of them is parallel to one axis, the other one is parallel to or along the other axis. So we now have F4 perpendicular the component of that force that's perpendicular to the radius vector and F4 parallel. And again, which one of those do we actually care about? Yeah, the perpendicular component. So we would multiply all of the radius times just the perpendicular component of the force. And that tells us the amount of force which again should be the exact same result as the total radius times the total, the entire radius magnitude times the entire force magnitude times sine of the angle between them. Same result, just a different way of looking at the geometry. Or lastly, you could keep the force as it is and split up the radius into components. Any other questions on the force components here before you erase that bit? Okay, so if we instead keep the force exactly as it is, but set up a coordinate system based on that force, split up the radius into components, we'll create a, a coordinate system based on the force. So we'll draw in an axis parallel to the force. There's our parallel axis and an axis perpendicular to the force. There's our perpendicular axis. And we now want to split up the radius vector into components based on those axes. So using our radius vector, and you can move the axes around, by the way. The only important thing is the, the direction of those axes. You can move it to a new location if you want to shift the origin. So if you want, you could take these axes and shift them so that they are here instead. If, it's, if you find it easier to look at it from that perspective with the vector we care about at the origin. Either way, we can take the, the radius vector and flatten it onto one axis. So we could say this is the perpendicular component and this would be the parallel component the component of the radius parallel to the force and the component of the radius perpendicular to the force. And again, all we care about is the perpendicular component. So we would multiply just the perpendicular component of the radius times the magnitude of the entire force. And that would also tell us the torque. So three different ways you can calculate the torque. They all give you the same result. It's useful to be familiar with all three, but in any given situation, you would just use whichever one of those three is most practical based on what you already know and or what's gonna be easiest to measure. Any other questions on the component stuff? 
then let's try on an example of actually uh, putting all this together numerically. Let's say we have uh, a wall with a pole sticking straight out of it. And at the end, let's say we know the distance is also, let's say this is uh, four meters long. And let's say the mass of this is uh, 10 kilograms. And let's say we have hanging from the end of it, a 100 kilogram object. We call that capital M. So 100 kilogram object would be totally negligible. So we've got a 100 kilogram mass hanging from the end of this pole. And of course, if we just have it like that, it's probably gonna fall over. Uh, what other structure could we have here that you think might help hold that up? Like if you wanted to actually have, maybe you've got a sign outside of a store or something. You've got a sign hanging from this post. What else could you include here that would actually hold that up, prevent it from falling over? Like if you're trying to build this sign, but it keeps falling over. Yeah, yeah some something sort of, with a diagonal structure. Yeah, some sort of diagonal. And there are a couple of options here. You could put in underneath, you could put in like a, a crossbar here. You could put in a wooden support beam, or you could have it hanging from a rope or something. So either one of those would work. A diagonal support bar here or a rope up here. Let's say we put in a rope to hold this up. Let's say we have a rope from the end here up to some location up here. And let's say we anchor this at a location three meters above. So a four meter long pole, we have a rope anchored three meters up on the wall. And let's say we wanna figure out how much tension is gonna be in that rope. Because that's important. If you, if you know how much tension the rope is going to be under, you know how strong of a rope you need. Ropes typically have a certain amount of tension, a certain amount of force they can support. And anything more than that, the rope might break. So we want to figure out how much tension is in the rope. How much tension must this rope support? And that'll give us an idea of how strong of a rope we're gonna need here. So let's try this. Uh, first of all, we wanna make absolutely sure that this sign, this, po this pole does not move. What does that suggest about the forces and the torques? Yeah, the total force has to be zero and the total torque has to be zero. And this goes back to Newton's laws. We want to make absolutely sure that this object, in fact, every object in the system, but in most especially any one object we want to choose, we want to make sure all the forces on any one object add up to zero so that there's no translational acceleration. And we want to make sure that all the torques on any one object add up to zero so that there's no rotational acceleration. Because we don't, I mean, this, this object presumably is not moving right now. We want to make sure it does not start moving. So that means that the, uh, the total force has to be zero. So it doesn't start translationally moving. And the total torque has to be zero. So it doesn't start rotationally moving. And uh, what do you mean by a 10 kilogram mass and 100 kilogram mass together? I just, I couldn't, I couldn't read what the small beam mass was. Oh, so. yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the beam itself is 10 kilograms. I'm make that a little bigger. And this hanging block is 100 kilograms. Okay. And for the notation, I'm going to call that little m and big m. Okay. 
Uh, but yeah, we want to make sure we're going to assume that the sum of the forces added to zero and the sum of the torques adds up to zero on any one object. Because for any given object, what we care about is the forces acting on that object and the torques acting on that object. And if we wanted to choose one object to analyze, what's the, what do you think is the one object that's going to be most important to consider here? Yeah, the pole itself. The, the hanging block is going to be much more straightforward to analyze, but it's not really going to be very interesting. The pole itself is, is, I think, going to be the most useful to analyze here because there's so many forces acting on it. And most importantly, the force of the rope. If we care about the, for, the tension in the rope, we want to look at some object that the rope is actually connected to. The hanging mass isn't directly connected to the rope. The hanging mass is hanging from the pole. But the rope is supporting the pole. So we care about the pole because that's what's most directly interacting with the rope that we care about. In fact, if we did make a free body diagram for the mass, the hanging block, uh, the hanging block, since it's a fairly compact object, we can basically treat it as just a single point. So the free body diagram for the block, we could treat as just a single point. And what forces are acting on the block itself? Gravity is one. Yeah, we definitely have gravity pulling straight down. I'm going to call that FGB, the force of gravity on the block. And how strong is that going to be? It's like roughly a thousand newtons, right? Yeah. Like if we take if we round off gravity to 10 meters per second squared and multiply that by the mass, mass times gravity, we get a thousand newtons. And 10 times 100. You can use 9.8 if you want. Uh, yeah, more realistically, gravity on Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared. But for these purposes, if we just want a quick estimate, we can round it off to 10. But yeah, more accuracy would be 9.8. Um, however, the block is not falling. So what other force is preventing it from falling here? Is I was gonna say, is it like technically it's not just normal force because the rope's kind of acting like mm -hmm. I don't know. So is there a normal force in this case? Uh, is, well, the normal force would be if that block was resting on some sort of surface or pushed up against some surface. Oh, okay. Normal force is when you've got two surfaces in contact with each other. So in this case, I think it would be yeah, it would be a force from a rope. But note that that's specifically from this short rope connecting it to the pole, not from the long rope connecting to the wall. Because this long rope is not actually directly connected to the mass. So I would just say, I would probably describe that as a force from the pole, the force from the pole on the block. Because the, the block and the pole are connected to each other. So I would say the pole is exerting an upward force on the block. So let's say that's the force of the pole on the block. Let's just call that FP, the force from the pole acting on the block. And how strong would you expect that to be? Should be a thousand newtons, right? Yeah, should also be a thousand newtons. Because what do these have to add up to? We have to net zero. Right, we expect the net force to be zero because the block is not accelerating. So the fact that they have to add up to, z to be zero means this 1,000 Newton or downward force has to be countered by some 1,000 Newton uh, upward force, or possibly several other forces that just add up to 1,000 Newtons upwards. But the important thing is the total force on the block is zero. So the block itself is pretty straightforward. There's only these two forces acting on it. We know they have to add up to zero because the block is not accelerating. But the most important thing the block tells us is that the pole and the block are interacting. So this force is also going to inform the forces acting on the pole itself. So let's take a look at the pole. The fact that the pole has forces acting on it at several different locations suggests we should actually draw not just a free body diagram, like a, a single point with a bunch of arrows, 
we should draw this as what we call an extended free body diagram, meaning we actually care about where the forces are being applied. So I'm going to draw the pole as a bar, not just as a single point. And what forces are acting on the pole here? The block. Yeah, the block is exerting a force on the pole. And this goes back to Newton's third law. If the pole is pulling the block up, then the block is also pulling the, the pole down. So we're going to have a downwards force of 1,000 newtons from the block on the pole. And where should that downwards force be located? At the end of the pole? Yeah, the far right end of the pole, because that's where the block is interacting with the pole. So we're going to definitely have this downwards force of 1,000 newtons. This is the force from the block on the pole. So these two forces, the force of the block on the pole and the force of the pole on the block, that's what we would call a Newton's third law pair. These are the equal and opposite forces that Newton's third law is talking about. Uh, what other forces could be acting on the pole itself? The rope, the longer rope? Yeah, this longer rope is exerting a tension force that's also at the end, the right end. And which direction would you say that force is going to be in? Well, technically, the magnitudes on a diagonal, but the horizontal will be like in the opposite direction of the F B one, right? Uh, well, we could split it up into components, yeah. But what we what we're going to draw in the diagram is the the diagonal itself. The the force of tension is always in the direction parallel to the rope, because the only thing a rope can really do is pull. So any tension force is going to be in the direction of the rope itself. So force of tension is just in the direction of the rope. Uh, we could find that angle using an inverse tangent if we want, because we know the opposite side and the adjacent side. So you can use inverse tangent of 3 over 4 to find that angle if we need it. But I think it might be easier in this case to just use proportions instead of trigonometry. However, we don't know how strong the force of tension is yet. Uh, what other forces are acting on the pole then? Does the pole itself have mass? Yeah, we got a force of gravity, right? Because the pole has mass and the pole is near a planet. So we're definitely going to have a force of gravity in the pole. And where should we treat that force of gravity as being located? Yeah, in the center. Center of mass, exactly. Uh, and for for and for any object, if the if the density is uniform, if this is made of the same material throughout the whole thing, we should assume the center of mass is just the geometric center, which in this case would be halfway, two meters from either side. Uh, if the object is made of a variety of a variety of different materials, the center of mass doesn't have to be the actual geometric center. Like if this end is made of heavier metal and this end is made of more lightweight metal, the center of mass is going to be biased towards the heavier end. But in this case, let's assume the density is uniform, so the center of mass is the geometric center. We're going to get a downward force of gravity that's equal to um, mass times acceleration of gravity as usual, 10 kilograms times, let's round this off to 10 meters per second squared, so 100 newtons. So we've got a 100 newton downwards force caused by gravity. We've got a 1,000 newton downward force on the end caused by the block. We've got an unknown diagonal force caused by tension. And also, what else is the pole interacting with? What's the one other object the pole is connected to? I don't know if it's like the wood post or wall or something. Yeah, the wall itself. Whatever, whatever thing it's connected to here. So we're going to have also a force from the wall. And we don't even know what direction that is yet. Because uh, the wall, the idea is this, this is presumably some sort of hinge. The hinge could be exerting any force in any direction. In fact, we would probably want to treat that as the pivot. The connection with the wall is the pivot point. And the pivot point is typically going to exert whatever force is needed in whatever direction is needed 
to make sure the forces all cancel out. So we're gonna have force from the wall. And for that, we don't know the magnitude and we don't know the direction. Typically the force from the pivot point is gonna be whatever is needed to cancel out everything else. But it looks like those are the only forces. Force of gravity on the pole, force of the block on the pole, force of tension from the rope on the pole, and force from the wall on the pole. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> and then as far as the equations are concerned, we know the forces add up to zero. And separately, we know the torques add up to zero. The thing is though, since this is a two dimensional problem, saying that the forces add up to zero is actually two equations because each of these forces has an X component and a Y component. And you could use any axes you want. You could use a tilted axis, but I think in this case, it's probably gonna be easiest to use the standard X and Y axes in part because some of the forces are already purely in the Y direction. So let's say we, we split this up into the sum of the X components of forces equals zero. And separately, the sum of the y components is zero. So what forces here could have x components? Tension. Yeah, tension definitely has an x component. And we may as well split this up preemptively. We've got an x component, we've got a y component. So we've got FTY, and we've got FTX. We're going to have the x, the y, the x, I got those mixed up, y component and an x component. So we've got ftx. And what else could have an x component here? Yeah, the wall itself, right? The wall, because this pivot point, the, the force from the pivot point on the wall could be in any direction. That means it could contain an x component. In fact, it's going to have to, because something has to cancel out this x component. So the x component of the force of tension plus the x component of the force of the wall has to add up to zero. We don't know either one of those though, so we can't really go any further with that equation yet. But for y components, it looks like every one of these has a y component. We've got y component of force of the wall, y component of tension, and for gravity and the uh, force from the block, those are purely in the y direction. So that's just gonna be negative 100 and negative 1000. Uh, Casey, quick question just for mm -hmm. like semantics. Um, I noticed you're not drawing the vector line over the X and Y. Is that intentional? Uh, for these, yes. The, co the components do not count as vectors. Okay. So for instance, FT is a vector. FTX and FTY are not vectors. Those are just the components of the vectors. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we still don't really have enough information here. We've got too many variables. Looks like we've got four unknown values. FTX, FTY, FWX, FWY, and only two equations. We could get a third equation by writing out the torques adding up to zero. And we can also get a fourth equation based on how FTY and FTX are related. In this case, we know, for instance, that this triangle of the tension force has to be uh, similar to this triangle of the distances. So by proportions of the similar triangles, we know the ratio FTY over FTX has to match the ratio of three over four, because that's the same angle, same ratios for the triangle. So we could say FTY over FTX equals three over four. So you could use that to make some substitutions. For instance, multiply both sides by FTX, we get FTY equals three fourths FTX. So you could use that as a substitution, replace FTY with three fourths FTX. And that will at least reduce it from four unknown variables to three unknown variables. And then if we can get a third equation, which we have in the, in the terms of torque, we can get three equations, three unknowns, treat that as a system of equations and solve for those three unknowns. As for torques, are there any, tor any forces here that do not exert any torque? 
any forces where RF sine theta would have to be zero. Yeah, the force from the wall. Since the force from the wall is at the pivot point, the radius would be zero. The distance from the pivot points to the force of the wall is zero. So that means the wall exerts no torque. So this is one of the really handy things about the torque equation. Any forces at the pivot point produce no torque. So this means that the torque equation, the sum of the torques adding up to zero will often be simpler in the sense that it doesn't involve as many unknowns. In fact, if you were to write out the torque equation here, only the other three forces are producing torque. So we've got the torque from gravity, the torque from the block, the torque from tension adding up to zero. And these I would think of as vectors, but they're all either straight in or straight out. So in terms of torque, we can treat this as a one dimensional problem. We can calculate each of those as just a radius times a distance. For gravity, what's the distance from the pivot point to the location where gravity is being applied? Wait, yeah. sorry. What was that? What's the TB again, the torque? Uh, torque from the block. Oh, so okay. the torque on the pole caused by the block hanging from it. Thank you. Um, and yeah, gravity is two meters away from the pivot point. So radius times force, that'll be two meters times 100 Newtons. And sine theta, the radius vector and the force vector are perpendicular. So sine theta is sine 90, that's just going to be one. You could also think of that as the radius times just the perpendicular component of the force. It's just that the perpendicular component of the force is the whole thing. Then torque from the block. The block is the full four meters away from the pivot point. So four meters times a thousand newtons. And then torque from tension. Tension is also four meters away. And We've already got this split into components, FTX and FTY. Which one of those components would we actually use for calculating torque? Just Y, right? Yeah, just the Y component. How do we get the two meters here? Uh, that was two meters because the force of gravity is located at the center of mass, which is two meters away from the pivot point, halfway from the pivot points to the other end, the center of mass of that pole, of that object. Uh, and yeah, the, for, ten, for the tension force, if we think of this as torque equals radius times just the perpendicular component of the force, the radius vector is the full four meters. The force of tension, we could use radius times force of tension times sine of the angle, but we don't know the angle. I mean, we could find the angle using inverse tangent of three fourths. But I think it's going to be easier to just recognize that the y component is the perpendicular component to the radius. So we can just take the radius, four meters, times just the y component, FTY. And we could actually then use this to solve for FTY, since that's the only unknown left. We got to be careful about sine, though, because sine represents direction uh, in terms of positive or negative sine. And for direction, uh, what would be the direction of the torque from gravity? Gravity is pointing down, the force of gravity is downwards, but what's the direction of the torque from gravity? Should be negative. Uh, well, which direction though? Down. Is that inwards, outwards, okay. left, right, up, down? Yeah, into the tape. And again, you can find that from the right hand rule. From the pivot point, stretch out your fingers straight. Yeah, other side. Stretch out your fingers straight towards the location of the force, and then curl your fingers in the direction of the force, and your thumb tells you the direction of the torque. So gravity is an inwards torque. The block is also creating an inwards torque, but tension is creating an outwards torque from curling your fingers in that direction. So that means we just need to, we can assign positive or negative however we like, as long as we're consistent about it. So let's say we treat inwards as negative and outwards as positive. And then these terms have to add up to zero. So now you've got negative 200 plus negative 4,000 plus 
positive four times this unknown equals zero. Since that's only one unknown, you can solve for that unknown, plug that back into both of the other equations and solve for the other forces as well. And note that FTY is equal to three fourths FTX. So once you have FTY, you can also find FTX and then use the Pythagorean theorem to find the actual force of tension. Any questions on that? All right, so try running the numbers on that yourself for some more practice. Try actually solving these systems of equations. See if you can figure out the force of tension in terms of how strong it is and the force of the wall, both how strong it is and what direction as an angle. So give that a try. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and I will see you next time. Thank you. You're welcome.